Okay, so we just went over an example of proving that two graphs are isomorphic to each other. But um, here's another example of two graphs. I stole this one from the textbook. So uh, if you have read the, read the lesson, you know the result of this. Um, question is, are these isomorphic? Well, uh, you can check some basic things like you can check uh, the degrees, right? Um, or the number of vertices. You can check the number of edges. They've got the same number of vertices. They've got the same number of edges. If you check the degree sequence, the degree sequence is even the same. Um, it's, I believe it's 3, 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2, 2 for both of them. Uh, and yet, if you try moving these things around and try kind of like trying to associate vertices in your head and figure out like, well, could we rearrange one of these into the other? seems like you really can't. So these, in fact, are not isomorphic to each other. Okay, They're not isomorphic. But the question remains, well, how do you prove that two things are not isomorphic? Okay, well, to help us figure, out, figure that out, it helps to look at, um, to ask the question, when you apply an isomorphism, what properties are preserved? under that isomorphism, meaning what properties does the original graph have that the new graph is also going to have, and vice versa. These are called graph invariants, properties that don't change uh, when you look at one, look at different graphs that are, that are isomorphic to each other. So properties that don't change upon, like when a, an isomorphism function is applied. Some uh, basic ones that we've already identified are things like the number of vertices, right? If two graphs are going to be uh, isomorphic, there has to be this bijection between the vertex sets, and so they have to be the same size. So number of vertices. Likewise, number of edges, because we need the bijection to preserve adjacency, and we need the inverse function to preserve adjacency as well. So that means that the number of edges has to end up being the same both ways. Uh, and so, like I was saying before, if the adjacencies are preserved under the function, the degree sequences of those graphs have to be the same as well. So the degree sequence is a graph invariant. But there's other graph invariants. So um, I'm going to introduce a couple of new things here. First is uh, the idea of a subgraph. So a subgraph of G with vertex set V and edge set E is a graph, I'm just going to call it G prime with vertex set V prime and edge set E prime, where V prime is some subset of V. Okay, uh, I think it might be most accurate to say proper subset there. Uh, so uh, the G prime is a sub is going to be a subgraph of G, and it's going to have a vertex set, which is some subset of the vertex set of V. And E prime is also a subset of E, where in particular E prime only includes edges between elements. of V prime. So we're going to draw a little example down here of a subgraph. So first of all, let's just make a graph. So there's an example of a graph. And then if I swap colors here, I can make a subgraph of this graph. So there's an example of a subgraph. I've got G prime, my subgraph in red there, whereas G, the original graph, was in uh, in black. So um, I've mentioned subgraphs before because they came up when we were talking about uh, when I was explaining bipartite graphs. Uh, and we said, well, um, a graph is bipartite if and only if it has no odd cycle subgraph. 
right? So um, this graph does have an odd cycle. You can see a little triangle over here, for example. Um, so yeah, so here's, here's a more formal definition of what subgraph is. And subgraphs are an example of a graph invariant. Okay, if they're the same shape, basically, right, then they're going to have the same subgraphs. And in particular, uh, that means the existence and number of subgraphs, of distinct, distinct subgraphs of a given type. So um, looking at this example over here, I'm going to count subgraphs of type C4. So C4, remember, is the um, the like four cycle. It's basically a, a rectangle, okay, or a, or a quadrilateral um, that you could find inside your graph. It's four vertices that are connected in a cycle. So one example of that can be seen right in the middle here. There is a C4 subgraph. Okay, so one. Uh, and then I can also find another one around the outside here. Ay, ay, ay. Oh. Okay, two. Uh, can I find any other C4 subgraphs in this G1? Mm -hmm. No. No, I can't. I can find some C4. C sixes, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, like if you look at sort of this funny shape around the outside here, it looks a little bit like a like a right angle measure. Um, that thing uh, is a C6, but I'm not thinking about those. I'm just counting C4s. Uh, oops. C4s. So I have two of them. All right, so now let's do C4s on the other graph. Well, I've got this one inside here again, right? And I've got the one on the outside. So therefore that's, so far that's two. Check them off, one, two. Uh, do I have any other ones? Oh, hey, check it out. Blue for this one. Right here, I have another example of a C4 subgraph. So graph G1 has two C4 subgraphs, whereas graph G2 has three C4 subgraphs. Now, since the number of uh, distinct subgraphs of a given type is a graph invariant, this information is enough to prove that these graphs are not isomorphic to each other. So uh, there we go. So that's some examples of graph invariants. There's another example of a graph invariant that we're going to be getting to in the next section, and that is connectivity. So things like is the graph connected, or the how many like distinct connected components does it have, and also how connected is it. We're going to learn about how to measure like the like the like the sort of extent to which it is connected, or the strength of its of its connectivity. Um, and there's several different ways, and those are all graph invariants as well. But I'll just wait till the next section to um, to explain that. All right, that's it.